time, which covers the seven years of the great tribulation on earth. As we read through uh, the last half of chapter 10, where we left off, and then the two witnesses in chapter 11. But then when we get to chapter 12, and most everybody who works in any way, shape, or form, form on trying to interpret the book of Revelation will move to an understanding that 12 and 13 are a historical recap that covers uh, from the past all the way into the future. So that's a little bit of a paradigm shift because right now what we're working with, and I've shared with you how the seals and the trumpets uh, are things that are going to happen during the time of the tribulation, great tribulation, after the church has been raptured out of the earth. Now, to be honest with you, when we get to some of the passages dealing, and when you get the material that have to do with the rapture of the church, you'll find that not everybody necessarily agrees with the fact that there's a pre, and when we say pre-trib rapture, that's what we're talking about, that, that during this time that we're looking at, and this is the view that I hold to, a pre-trib rapture. That is that the church will be taking out, taken out of the world before the Great Tribulation takes place. Now there's some people that probably the next um, most common uh, view to hold are those who hold to the fact of a mid-tribulation rapture. And it has to do with the two witnesses that we're going to see in chapter 11 who won't be able to be put to death for three and a half years. And there are some who believe that that three and a half years is significant to the point where the church would be raptured out during the middle of the Tribulation. I don't hold to that view. Because as I said, there's several things, and you'll you'll see it, and I, I list some of the reasoning in the material that you'll get when we when we when you get the material that has to do with the rapture. And that is it next week. I think it is next. I think it will be in the stuff that we hand out next week. But you can look at the scriptures. But see, personally, I don't think that the Lord calling the church His bride uh, would permit the bride to go through the agony of the great tribulation, because the earth will be in great agony. Now, never forget the fact that in the interpretation of the distress and the things that are going to happen on the face of the earth during the time of the tribulation, the Lord is setting things up. Now, it doesn't mean that he's gone. It doesn't mean that he's turned over everything to mankind to run rampant and to destroy the earth. That's not it at all. In fact, you see that when John sees these things, particularly what we discussed in the trumpets and in the uh, in the seal, releasing the seals and then the trumpet sounding, that the angels who hold the four winds and different things, supernatural uh, beings, are all involved in this. In other words, it's taking place according to God's plan. It's all taking place according to God's plan. He has it in His hand, and nothing can thwart God's sovereign will for this earth. Nothing can change God's sovereign plan. Now, individually, however, we believe as Wesleyans that, uh, that you still have the right to free will, uh, that you have the right to choose. So whether or not you'll be participating in this, or whether or not you'll be with the church in the rapture, or whether or not you'll be in eternity with the Lord, that's your choice. That is your choice. But regardless of your choice to be in eternity or to be on this earth, nothing can change God's sovereign will. And so that's why you see God's hand very definitely at work during the time of the tribulation and the things that take place on the earth during this time. So let's begin at, um, pick up where we left off last week with John eating the little book in verse 8 of chapter 10. It says, Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said, Give me the little book. And he said to me, take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Now, and we, we referred, we began to get on this subject last week toward the end of Bible study, and that is that the interest that people have, and somebody was telling me just a little bit ago, it's kind of amazing when you turn around and see the number of mega churches and the number of TV preachers that are working in the book of Revelation right now. And John Hagee, and I like a lot of things that John Hagee says, but John Hagee's working uh, in the book of Revelation, and there are a lot of preachers who are. Joseph Prince, um, I wasn't real familiar with Joseph Prince's ministries, but I've seen him on the Christian Network here, and I found out a little bit more about him, and I saw him preaching um, for the Lakewood Church, Joel Osteen's church. Um, not too long ago, and he uh, had some things to say about the book of Revelation and so on. So it just seems as though 
Uh, there's more interest. If you remember about a year and a half, two years ago, there were some things on the Discovery Channel that had to do, and from time to time they'll replay them about the apocalypse and the end of time and, and all of that kind of thing. So when you see it, and when you first look at it at first blush, the book of Revelation has that kind of sweetness to it. In other words, it's there, it's in the Word of God, it's, it's something that, uh, that titillates you, it's something that excites you, it's something that interests you, it's something that, that is, is sweet to taste. It's something that's sweet to taste, but when you get into it, it's very bitter. It's, a, it's tough. It, it's, not only is it tough to interpret, but the contents, and my wife does not like anything gory. She cannot stand anything gory. And, and we'll get into these arguments sometimes and say, but honey, it's there. It's written. I didn't write it. <laughs> you know, but it's there in the Word. Now, the thing is, it's very, very tough to handle. It is tough to handle because none of us wants to see. We don't want to think about that kind of destruction. We don't want to think about that kind of death. We don't want to think about the things that are going to happen that are poured out. We, we think, how bad would it be to live here during that time? And it will be bad. It will be terrible. It would be a very, very terrible thing to be on the earth during the time of the Great Tribulation. So that to me is what this little passage at the end of chapter 10 means. When John sees and God has given him, is that he, is, he is the conduit for what the Lord wants the church to have in this. And he says, this little book, he said, when I tasted it, it was bitter. Uh, but when it got to my, um, I mean, when I tasted it, it was sweet. But when it got to my stomach, it was bitter. And so it is with the church. When you when you see it, and you know that it's there. You know it's got um, the study of eschatology, which is the study of the end times, is is interesting. But you see, and we were kind of joking about this this morning at breakfast. But the Mayan calendar, you know, we're all going to be gone on what May thirty first in twenty twelve. This year, the end of May, uh, you know, so um, if I believe that, I'd call the bishop and say, don't apply an annual conference, you know, in June, because we're all going to be gone the 20, you know, the 31st of May. But everybody has that kind of interest in the end, you know, there's that fascination with it. And that's what John sees, and that's what John's participating in. Now, however, uh, let's move into the 11th chapter because here are the two witnesses who are doing the measuring and we started to get into this too last week. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar and those who worship there, but leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it. For it has been given to the Gentiles and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Now before we get to the witnesses, here's what I want you to see uh, on the whiteboard and we'll go behind this whole thing. Uh, on the whiteboard over here that we've drawn up. And I would really like, now you can't see this, and I didn't bring the other board in here tonight, but I would like to have two volunteers who will walk with this slowly around the room just so that you can look at it up close. You, you can't see that back there. I, I realized the other night when I sat down back there and looked at it up here on the thing that you couldn't, those of you back there can't see it. So who would walk around with this for me? Come on, you don't have to do anything. Just, just walk around and hold it. Bill, who will help Bill? Somebody help Bill. Okay, Jimmy. Y'all just take that and start start along just walk down all the aisles. I just want you to glance at it and have a knowledge because this is a rough outline of it here. And I want you to see it because when Ezekiel measured, see, Ezekiel saw the same thing. Had a vision where the Lord gave him a measuring rod and told him to measure the city of Jerusalem in Ezekiel chapter 44. And it goes from there to the 48th chapter, and that's how the, the book of Ezekiel closes out with this vision that Ezekiel sees. Now, for some reason, the Lord wants us to understand that what he has given the measure, when you actually work it out, and we don't have time to do all of that, but when you actually work out the measurements, y'all, it's huge. It's actually huge. It's big enough for everybody, and that's what I take from it, from Ezekiel's vision of measuring the new Jerusalem, the new city that God has planned. Nobody will be left out because of size. It won't be like Mary and Joseph and the baby going to the inn where there was no room for them. You all know what that means, don't you? That they weren't necessarily put out of the inn because there were no more rooms. There was only one room. Everybody slept in a communal room. In fact, you see that in the parable when Jesus said, which of you have uh, had your children down at night and you're sleeping in front of the door? And a friend comes and beats on the door and says, help me out. 
And he says, because of his importunity, because he keeps disturbing the family and the children, he wakes up and gets the kids up out of the way and he opens the door. Because that was the way they protected him, right? So when the innkeeper said to Mary and Joseph and the baby, there was no room for them in the inn, it was basically just a room probably about a quarter of the size of this fellowship hall. And they were all on sleeping mats in, the, in a common room. Now, you know, a manger was, was when I say mean enough, I mean... What's, what's the word I want in, in vernacular? Um, common enough, but it was at least private. You know, if Jesus had been born, if Mary had had Jesus in the inn, there would have been 20 people all watching this event take place. No privacy there. So it was really neat that he went to the manger. But the point is that Christ came into this world. There was no room for them in the end. What the apostle, or I mean, what the prophet wants, uh, what God wanted the prophet to tell the children of Israel is that what they see in the New Jerusalem and what He gives them to measure the New Jerusalem, it will be huge. It will be big enough um, for everybody. Now, what He did tell him to measure, and this is the most significant thing, is in the Book of Revelation, is what He told him to leave out of the measurement. And this is what's fascinating to me. This is kind of the picture of what, what Bill has over there. This was erected by, the, the outside was erected by, well, you remember the first temple was done by who? Solomon. And then who? Zerubbabel. You know, rebuilt, rebuilt the temple. And then the time of Herod the Great, when the temple was built during Jesus' day and time. Now, in that temple, the praetorium where the Roman soldiers were kept was on the same level as the temple itself in Jerusalem. Uh, Jody just got back from Israel. Where's Jody? She's here somewhere. Jody, did you go to the mock-up? Did you go to that ministry? Isn't it something to see? It's incredible to go to Jerusalem and see the actual size. There's a scale model of the city of Jerusalem during Jesus' day and time. And it's wonderful to see. But you see, here's what he tells them to leave out is the court of the Gentiles because that was not a part of God's plan. It wasn't a part of God's plan to have Roman praetorium with their horses and everything else. In fact, one of the great things that may have been one of the references to the abomination of desolation. When Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said, when you see the abomination of desolation, realize that these things are happening, these things are coming. In 70 A.D., one of the Roman emperors rode his horse. He rode his horse into the temple, all the way in to the holy place. And the Jews were just crushed. Rode his horse in, not only that, but he sacrificed pigs on the altar. And you remember that that um, pig was one of those animals that under Old Testament law was forbidden. And a lot of people want to think that in 71 AD that this may have been one of the abominations of desolation that the word talks about and referred to in the Old Testament as well as Jesus referring to it in Matthew 24 and 25. And he said, when you see these things happening, look, be aware that there's going to be a time of flee. Well, right after that, 72 AD is when the diaspora took place, what's called the diaspora in Jewish history. That's when Jews were spread across the face of the earth. Some people estimate that there were less than 5,000 Jews remaining in Israel after the great diaspora in 70 AD. But what did they take with them when they ran around the world? By 72 AD, what was happening to the church? The church was growing. The church in Jerusalem was growing. It was the strongest church. It was the heart of the church. And from there, when the Jews were made to flee Israel, and I think I've told you, and again, this is one of those gory facts that my wife never likes me to relate, but Josephus, the historian, the Jewish historian, says that in March, this, this month that we're in now, in March of 72 A.D., that the blood in the streets of Jerusalem did not dry. That a million and a half Jews were put to death. Now remember, these weren't bullets. This wasn't gas. It wasn't mass killing. It was by the point of a sword. Mm. And with bows and arrows and spears. And Josephus says that the word was that for... What did he say? A month? 
over a month that the blood did not dry in the streets of Jerusalem. That's how gory it was. That's how bad it was. Now, the rest of the Jews, however, throughout the land of Israel fled to every corner of the world. And I brought to you the fact that the Bar Kokhba coins have been found in Phoenix City and up in Jeffersonville, Indiana, and so on. Different places in the world, which evidence the fact that Jews made it into this, into this part of North America at some point in the past. So the point being that what did the New Testament Christians take with them? They took the gospel. And that was one of the ways that the gospel was spread into the world at that time. Now, however, it was a desperate time. It was a very, very desperate time. But in this vision that John sees, he tells them, do not measure. Don't measure this. This was not a part of God's plan. This was a part. The men's court was the court. The ladies, this was Old Testament law. It's not the law under Jesus, and that's why the veil, when it was written to, made open the Holy of Holies when we're all admitted and where to, to where we're all admitted. But it was the men's court. Those who were not of the tribe of Levi could go into this if they were Jewish men. Uh, the priest court, only those of the tribe of Levi and serving in the temple could go into the priest court. Then the outer court, those who served the temple and those whose duty it was that particular month to work in the temple, to provide the showbread, to provide the sacrifices, to take care of cleaning the temple, and the daily ministrations, they could go into the outer court. Only the high priest and those who were really in charge of things could go into the holy place, which was, and this is not to scale, please understand, that is more to scale, the thing that they took around, Jimmy and Bill took around. But in the very back of that was the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, where the mercy seat sat and where the Ark of the Covenant sat until it was probably carried away in the captivity, the Babylonian ca or Syrian captivity. But uh, this is the area that the Shekinah glory of God would come down out of heaven and sit on this place when it was the tabernacle. Here's uh, Nancy's got up a picture of the. Um, oh no, that's the temple. That's the temple itself. And that's the Temple Mount uh, in Jerusalem. But in the old picture of the tabernacle, and I think we have that back in the room back there, it was literally the Shekinah glory of God. They could see the physical manifestation of God coming down and sitting over the most holy place. And do you remember that I told you, according to the law, when Moses heard it from God's voice, face, not face to face exactly, nobody's seen God's face and lived, to tell about it, but person to person, that God had told Moses that only the high priest, one day a year, on the Day of Atonement, could enter into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, there to offer the blood sacrifice for the people. So uh, it's a fascinating thing to me to see and to understand that this temple, this will be where God dwells with his people on earth. When he comes, there's going to be a temple in Jerusalem. It's going to be rebuilt. What a day that's going to be. That would be incredible. Now, I personally believe that it's going to be here for the thousand-year reign of Christ. It's not going to be built during the time of the tribulation. There's too many other things that are happening on the earth. But part of the new, part of the millennial reign of Christ on this earth, his physical presence being in his capital city of Jerusalem, uh, part of that whole picture is that he will... Uh, the temple will be rebuilt, and he will be in the midst of his people. Now, um, the two witnesses begin, uh, go back to verse 3 then. Uh, well, verse 2, let's repeat verse 2. He says, but leave out the court which is outside the temple, do not measure it. For it's been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Now, a lot of people have a lot of different interpretation about who it actually is during the time of the tribulation. You know, what, what particular army, what particular army from any other part of the world, some kind of organized resistance to, to everything that's going on uh, as a part of the tribulation is going to be in Jerusalem. And they're going to be running to and fro uh, in the city itself. But now, he says, I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy uh, 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. 
These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Now, the thing is that, as I said, it's not that God is leaving the earth, even though the Holy Spirit has been withdrawn from the earth at this time. It's not that he's just turning over things to mankind to be run as, as we please. God's witness will always be here. And these two people, now a couple weeks ago I shared with you that a lot of people believe, and I, I personally don't see any reason not to hold to this, that the two witnesses are going to be those who have not passed through physical death yet. And the scripture gives us two who have not, and they are Enoch and Elijah, and uh, they have not passed through physical death. And I, I believe that scripture that says it's appointed unto man once to die, and <clears throat> after that the judgment. So that uh, these are the two probably... Uh, could be somebody else who knows, but I believe that these will be the two who will be the witnesses. But you see that they have the power to carry out the things that we've already seen in chapter 6 and 7 when the seals are open. The paradigm is that there's going to be a lot of destruction there. Fire is going to be a part of that. Drought is going to be a part of that. Flood is going to be a part of that. But here, the witnesses, these two witnesses to God's power are going to be the one, are going to be the ones who may have part of the control over this. Now, if you saw this, if you actually saw this, if you saw this taking place, if you could look on your TV or your phone or your iPad or whatever and watch this taking place, what would be your response? Wouldn't you say, well, I've read that in the scripture and I know that God is causing that and therefore I want to get myself in a right relationship with God. That would be the normal response. That would be the response of anybody who has any sense whatsoever. But y'all, that never happens during the time of the tribulation. We don't see it. I said this before. I say it with all due respect to those who have studied the word and hold a different interpretation than I do, and that is this is not left behind. It is not left behind. I'm sorry, but I don't see it. I don't see it. And, and if I were here and I saw these two witnesses proclaiming the power of God, and they had the ability to control things on the face of the earth, I would be on my face before God, looking for a way out. Now, verse 7, pick up with verse 7. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Now, let me just say, that I really believe that what's being talked about here is those who will be in rule, uh, who by force of their own power will be uh, ruling probably the Antichrist, the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit, will more than likely be um, the Antichrist that will be ruling at the time, okay? And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, why does he call it? That, that's always fascinating to me. Why does he call it Sodom and Egypt? What, what were Sodom? Sodom was a, was a symbol of disobedience to God's law. It just was. Now, you can hold whatever view that you want, but that's, that's exactly what, what Sodom was. Sodom was a city that was filled with people who were living disobediently to God's law. Egypt was a country that was known for its idolatry. After all, what in the world? Who, who were some of the greatest kings of the ancient times? They were the kings of Egypt who believed that they were descended from the sun god of all things. And they ruled people in ways that they thought was appropriate for a god to rule. And yet they all proved to be mortal. They all proved to be mortal. So Sodom, disobedience to God's laws. Egypt, idolatry. And, and this, this is what is symbolized by these, by these two, uh, the reference to these two places. And after all, if the king of glory, if the king of glory was crucified. Now, now here's an interesting thing. And... Jody, I'm sure you went to the Garden too, Gordon's, Gordon's Calvary. Um, one of the things that is fascinating about Gordon's Calvary, and there's the Church of the Crucifixion, the Roman Catholic site in, in Israel, but either one of those places 
are outside the city walls. Do you remember this? He was given a rod to measure the temple and the city. Jesus was crucified outside of the city. And that's something. He was not crucified in the city proper. In fact, in fact, as you stand on the Mount of Olives, you can look across the Kidron Valley and see at the point of that landmass that leads down into that valley. That's all the city of David was. It's being excavated even now. Past 20 years have revealed a lot of wonderful things, but that's all that the city of David was when David conquered it and it became uh, Jerusalem, which was the city of peace, David's city of peace in his capital city. And uh, right on the point of the city, of course, now it's huge. It's got the rest of the old city connected to it and all of West Jerusalem, which is modern and so on. But isn't it fascinating? Isn't it fascinating that Christ was not crucified in the city, but outside? The word says that he was crucified outside the city. Now, uh, let's see. Then those, those from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies. These are the two witnesses now for three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. You know, I, I've got to believe that there wouldn't be any torment for those who were being obedient to God. But you see, this is not a time of obedience. This is a time of witness. This is a time when the, when the two witnesses give witness to what God is doing, who God is, and to what he did, and that he's the creator, and that the redeemer came into this world. But there is complete and total disarray and disobedience on the part of mankind. And the, the, the point of all of this is that there's no repentance during this time. This is not a time when men and women are, are falling over themselves to repent. As a matter of fact, they rejoice over these over these witnesses now i've got a very personal family story that i just want to show, share with you briefly um it, it you know it might be pride on my part and i'm sorry if it is but nevertheless i do take a little pride in it there was one of our family forebears in the 1600s was caught at a home bible study with a copy of the scripture on it now this is this is recorded um various places but anyway in scotland and under the persecution of Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, this young man, who was a McGillivray, not, not exactly the McElrath that we have today, uh, but uh, the direct descendant, I'm a direct descendant of his, he was, he was uh, leading a home Bible study. Three British soldiers uh, arrested him, took him outside the house, pulled the Bible out of his pants pocket. They said he had big billowy pants on and had the Bible in there which Mary Queen of Scots had declared to be a capital offense if you were caught with a Protestant scripture because she was trying to convert Scotland back to Catholicism. You know, that whole thing with Cromwell and all that history and so on. I know you, you studied that world history and you don't want to go through it again. But nevertheless, they shot him on the spot and for two days his body lay in the streets and everybody was afraid to touch it. But then finally, a couple of ladies from the home Bible study so the history goes, uh, took his body to the Presbyterian Church that's in this little town in Scotland. And my aunt, Booney Ford, uh, my Uncle Bill Ford, who was pastor in this conference for 35 years, I buried him three years ago. Uh, my Aunt Booney's been over there, and she's been to the graveyard. She was my friend, my father's youngest sister. And she has actually seen the headstone. And they placed a headstone over his grave that said that he was a covenanter martyr. Now, for those of you who have Presbyterian background, you know that you come from Covenanters who were uh, Protestants during the time in Scotland and England and so on, and revolt against the Catholics and so on. But um, it just, it struck me in reading that the first time when I was a young preacher. I thought, you know, there are a couple martyrs in my family background. That's not, that's not the only one. There's another one that got caught up in that whole Covenanter thing too. But, um, but when I read this passage in Revelation, it just reminds me that they let his body lay for two days in the streets before they buried him. Now, the thing is about the witnesses, that everybody's going to see it. How could that be possible any other time in history, any more so than now? It, it, it is possible now. I mean, didn't you watch the news today and see something that happened around the world or in a, the Philippines or somewhere in Russia? And, 
Uh, I'm watching that watching that show on the animal planet called Wild Russia. And boy, that's incredible to think about the distance and the space and everything that's that's in Russia. But what happens here? What happens here? Even though the Earth rejoices over what's happened to the witnesses that they've been killed and their bodies are laying in the ground now after three and a half days in verse 11 after three and a half days the breath of life from god entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them and they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them come up here and they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them and in the same hour there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell and in the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Now, for those who participate in this and actually see the earthquake in Jerusalem, there's no doubt in my mind that finally there's that opportunity to praise God. Now, it doesn't say that they repented of their deeds. We don't find that during the time of the Great Tribulation. But finally, there's some sense of recognition that this is coming from somewhere else. It's not coming from the earth. It's coming from, from God. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. In verse 15, Then the seventh angel shout, uh, sounded, and there, was a loud, there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Where have you heard that? And the 24 elders... Uh, who sat before God on their thrones, fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. Now I want to stop right there and say that during this time of the tribulation on earth, this is what I believe is happening in heaven that the just are being judged for their works. That's you and me, every one of us. All of our works are going to be laid before God someday. How have we lived our lives in light of what he has done for us? In light of the God who has saved us, the Lord who has redeemed us, the one who has called us out. What have we done for him? What have we done for him? And I believe that during the time that the tribulation is taking place on the earth, that in heaven, there is that period when our works are going to be tried. Nations are going to be tried for their works, whether they've been for themselves or whether they've been for others uh, or whether they've been for God. So this is a time during the time of the, the, uh, the time of the dead that they should be judged. In other words, what, what's going to happen at the resurrection, at the first resurrection now happens when the rapture occurs. And you'll see this when you get the information on the rapture. When the rapture of the church occurs, that's the first resurrection, and those who are dead in Christ shall be raised with him, and the earth and the sea shall give up their dead. So don't confuse it, because there's going to be a second resurrection at the end of the millennial reign when the unjust dead come back to life at the great white throne judgment. But during the rapture, at the time of the rapture, the graves of the just will be opened. And the earth and the sea will give up their dead, and the, and the bodies of those who sleep shall be changed and will be made like unto his own glorious body. And that's when I believe that the spirit and the flesh will be reunited. And we will go to heaven. And during the time of the seven years of the tribulation on the earth, that's the time that Christians, the just dead, those who have died in Christ, will be with him and we will be tried. Our works will be tried whether they've been, been of wood, hay, or stubble, or precious stones. Now, he says, um, pick it, let's pick it back up at 18. The nations were angry, your wrath has come, the time of the dead, they should be judged, that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Now, in other words, God, it, it, it's, it's in God's hand to reward, and he will. He will. I think I shared with you, I um, talked with this, this boy who had been to Russia. And, and, no, no, no. India. In India. Speaking to a group of young pastors, 18, 19 years of age, they'd had theological training. They were preachers. They were being sent to a Muslim territory in India. And some of them fully expected never to come back alive. They were going to go and preach Christ. 
when he talked about what kind of a tough job they have, so this isn't a job. We don't get paid. We don't get paid. And yet they testify to the living Christ. And some of them will die for that. And this young boy said, he said, I felt like I ought to be sitting at their feet. He said, that, that's not the kind of faith that I have to live. But it's the kind of faith that they have to live. And it's in the hand of God Almighty to reward those who are faithful to him. Then the temple of God. Now here's, a, here's a neat, neat thing. I love this. The temple of God was opened in heaven. Do you remember that we said? Hold that picture up again. Doc, there you go. The temple built on this earth is a shadow of the things that are in heaven. We'll see that more fully when we get to the study in Hebrews where he, where he explains this. But what was set up on this earth was not just God's creative activity. Trees and mountains and seas were God's creative ability. But the, when he gave the design for the temple, the tabernacle first and then the temple, it was based on the pattern of things that exist in heaven. Listen, I'm going to get on the soapbox here. Forgive me just for a couple minutes. There are people who want to reduce, and I feel bad when I say this because I think maybe there was a time in my life when I kind of felt this way too. There are people who want to reduce the glory of worship, of holy things, the temple, to the common where there's no distinction. Listen, in God's mind, there's always been a distinction between the holy. And this is the most holy place, the holy of holies. And this is a pattern of things that are in heaven. And here we're seeing in this, in this at 19th verse, the temple of God was opened in heaven. And the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, earthquake, and great hail. Listen, is there anything common about this? None. Is there anything reductionist there? Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say and what I'm trying to avoid saying? Y'all, a church is a representative. We've got to be careful because I understand that the church is not bricks and mortar. It's the people who make it up. But you know what? That doesn't do away with the temple in heaven. There is a temple. There is a temple in heaven above. And we cannot imagine its glory. We cannot imagine. Why do you think that every time the prophets saw something that was connected with God, the only thing that they could tie it to was the very most precious things that we have? Jewels and gems and, and fine and precious metals that are so rare that men will spend a million, million dollars to get a hundred ounces of in, a, in the Alaskan wilderness. Oh my. You, you've heard the old story of the banker who was able to smuggle his suitcase full of gold bars into heaven. And Peter opens up his suitcase and he said, why'd you bring papers up here? <laughs> Streets of gold. Streets of gold. But listen, they are gold. And they're precious stones. And wait till we see. In a couple weeks, we're going to get in the back here where he describes the walls of the city and describes the gates. Can you imagine a pearl that big? And that's what he's going to describe for us. And it is God. And it is his dwelling place. And his habitation is with men. But oh, you see, there's nothing reductionist about it at all. It's, it's, it's glory. And it's everything beautiful and fine. And therefore, what we are and who we are and what we have and what we use to represent God ought to be the very best that we could give. You know, I don't care what people wear to church. You know, if blue jeans are the best thing that you could wear to church, then wear your best blue jeans. 
If tennis shoes are the best shoes you've got to wear at church, then wear your best tennis shoes. But give God your best. Give your best. He's given you his best. The temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. I have a feeling that somehow, some way, I've never heard anybody articulate this. I have a feeling that maybe some way, somehow, God has preserved the original ark. And that maybe he took it back to heaven. We couldn't protect it on earth. We couldn't keep it in its sacred place. There are lots of rabbinical stories about where the Ark of the Covenant went when Jerusalem was sacked three or four times in its history. Nobody knows. Was it melted down for its gold? Was it destroyed? Was it broken up? Does the Coptic Church have it in Egypt? That's one tradition that exists to this day. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. But what if God kept it for himself? What if, what if he just took it back to heaven? I don't know. Maybe there was an original ark, and what the ark was on, on earth that was built was a copy of the heaven, and I can understand that too. But we'll find out. We'll find out someday. Point of all of this is, point of all of this is, give them your best. Give them your best. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you because you gave your very best for us. And we admit and we confess that we are so negligent. And Lord, sometimes we take it so for granted. But as we come to this time of the year, as we move through Lent, and we come to this time when we celebrate Palm Sunday, and in our mind's eye, we ask ourselves, was it justified? Was it appropriate? Was the praise warranted? And oh Lord, how wonderful to know that Jesus said that day, if these should keep quiet, the very stones of the ground would cry out, heaven, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows your handiwork from day unto day utter speech and night unto night knowledge and oh Lord you gave so much wonderful to us and we confess that we have given so poorly in return Lord help us help us help us to be the people that you're calling us to be and to rep represent the king of kings uh, in a kingly way we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. You're dismissed. Thank you.